Thank you. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him for his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and the dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments and organs. Praise him with the loud cymbals. Praise him with the high sounding cymbals. Let everything, let everything, let everything that hath breath. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God. Blessed be your holy name. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your manifest blessing. Thank you. You may be seated. It's a distinct delight for me to be a part of this wonderful service tonight. I felt the presence of the Lord from the time I walked in. There was a hallowed spirit dwelling amongst you and amongst us. I am thankful for the wonderful singing of the choir and the singers. I'm very happy to be with Pastor Nathaniel Wilson and his wife Mary and with our other ministering servants who are on the platform as well as in the audience. I greet you in the name of the Lord and to all the saints of God. Praise God. It's great to be in the company of God's people. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. That was said by a busy man. His name was King David. He left the affairs of state, went to the house of God to sit in the glorious presence of the eternal God. Nothing greater, nothing better. The world can't duplicate it. It's only found in his presence. And I'm glad to be in his presence tonight. I saw my sister Grace. Greetings, Grace, Susanna. Nice to see you. We don't get much time to visit together since I'm busy and she's far away from where we live, so it's nice to see her. I'm very happy that uh, I can bring you the word of the Lord tonight. The word of God is precious. It's very precious to us. And uh, I want to speak to you tonight by the help of the Lord and by the anointing of the Holy Ghost on the subject, the miracle church, the miracle church. And uh, I'm going to draw your attention to a portion of scripture in the book of John's gospel. And I'm going to read to you several verses from the uh, 21st chapter. Uh, I would read all of the verses from the first verse down to the 11th verse to give you the uh, some some substance of the meaning that's bound up in these first 11 verses. But let me just uh, begin with the first verse and uh, move into several of the verses that are found within this context of thought. I'm reading to you from the first and the second verses of John 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and this wise, on this wise, showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. And down to the uh, fifth verse, Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. He said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. And then down to the eighth verse, and the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits dragging the net with fishes. Tenth verse, Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up, drew the net to land full of great fishes, 
and a hundred and fifty and three, and for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. I'd like to tell you tonight that across this world in which you and I live, there's a great apostolic revival taking place. And it's not just a hyped up revival. It's a visitation of the Holy Ghost. And I'd like for you to know that one of the greatest things to watch when the Holy Ghost visits his people is the remarkable manner in which it affects individuals. It not only is a blessing to individual people, but you will find that in the congregations that gather to lift up his name, there's a, also a wonderful blessing that falls upon the total group because they're feeling the impact of the Holy Ghost. And uh, we are seeing uh, great revivals take place. Uh, there are those who find it difficult to believe that 78,000 received the Holy Ghost one day in Ethiopia, in one day. And there were enough witnesses there to say that it actually happened. And then uh, just this past year, uh, there was 36,000 that received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in Ethiopia. Uh, talking to our friend, Brother Tekla Merriam, who is the leader in that area of the world. And when you talk about leadership, he is one of the great ones. The little brown man that gets up and shouts in the aisles of our national convention, you may not think much of him, but behind that brown skin is a heart that beats for the glory of God. And there is a vessel that's been used to bring thousands into the kingdom. He told me the other day there are now over two million Jesus name Holy Ghost people in Ethiopia. I think we ought to praise God for that. It's the work of the Holy Ghost. It's the precious work of the Holy Ghost. In the Philippines, they are writing now in religious papers, the fastest growing church in the Philippines is the United Pentecostal Church. There are over 65,000 in the last two years filled with the Holy Ghost in the Philippines. And the end is not yet. And in Papua New Guinea, they had such an outpouring of the Holy Ghost that they had to call for the Australian preachers to come and help baptize the hundreds that received the Holy Ghost. I think that's wonderful. And across the length and breadth of North America and Canada, the province of Canada, there are hundreds and thousands of people that are serving the Lord and are praising God. And not only that, but we are seeing a new revival touch our churches in local areas. Churches that in times past struggled to exist are now running over with new creation-born people. And it's wonderful to see it. Folks that have labored for long years to see the church grow are now looking out at packed, jammed uh, church audience or uh, church auditoriums, and they're also looking at people they never dreamed would ever come to God in this way. And the Trinitarians are very disposed to feeling hurt because we're being blessed. They can't understand how a one God people can be that blessed. But we know why. We know why. Years ago, they asked my dad, what was the difference between the Trinitarians and the Jesus only people that they, they call us that, you know, Jesus only. That means we deny the Father and deny the Holy Spirit, which is not true. No, we believe the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost is manifest in Christ. What's the difference, Brother Urshan, between the Trinitarians and the oneness people? He said, one uh, glorifies the experience and we glorify the giver. When you got the giver, you got it all. There's none like him in all this wide world. Nobody like Jesus. Nobody like him. And uh, I'm so very happy to tell you about the revival that is moving and being thrust upon cities through the wonderful witnessing of people. Uh, this is the day, the last opportunities we'll have before the Lord comes. Let me repeat that to you so you understand what I'm saying. 
one of the few last opportunities we'll have before the Lord comes to tell somebody about this great God. And it's our time to work if we ever worked in our lifetime. And many of us are trying to work. Some are shirking work. But uh, there's enough working to make it worthwhile. And we're seeing God pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. Uh, when I brought to you the portion of Scripture that I brought to you, I want you to notice very carefully, this is the third time the disciples saw Jesus alive. The third time. And I, I asked the question, you may ask the question, the question's in my heart. Why did it take three times before they got convinced he was alive? Why? Uh, you say, well, uh, there are several reasons. Well, let me tell you about one that believed it immediately. Mary Magdalene. Immediately. There was no questions. There was no uh, doubts. And notice what it says in the 18th chapter of the, or 18th verse of the 20th chapter. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. And she told that to the disciples. And uh, the same day at uh, even time, the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Then Jesus, uh, then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And then the last verse of that 20th, or rather the 23rd verse of that 20th chapter, Whosoever sins, ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. What a power he gave to the church. And this was a forerunner of the church that would be born at a later time. But here is the great calling card of the Lord. You will have the ability to remit sins you will have the ability to retain sins. He was telling this to the disciples. Well, there's always doubters around. How many have ever known the doubters exist? They exist outside the church, and a whole lot of them come to church. And uh, here was Thomas. One of the 12 called Didymus was not with them when Jesus came, and the excited disciples told him a fact that they, he had been in their midst a doubter can squelch happiness. A doubter can drown hope. And he had it to say, I won't believe except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, put my finger into the print of the nails, thrust my hand in his side, then I will believe. Until then, I will not believe. Reminds me of a man that came on our campgrounds in Indiana years ago. Brother Nicholas Bibbs was our district superintendent, and the man walked on the campgrounds and said to some of us standing there, do you know who I am? And we looked at him. He was bearded, lots of hair on his face, beard hanging down. I am the Apostle Paul. Brother Bibb said, do you know who I am? He said, no. He said, I'm Doubting Thomas. <laughs> there are always the doubters around. In this instance, this was doubting the fact that Jesus was alive. Now, in the second instance, this is uh, when Jesus came at the challenge of this man, Thomas. Notice what he said. He said to Thomas, this is the 27th verse of the 20th chapter, reach thither thy finger, behold my hands, reach hither thy hand, thrust it into my side, and be not faithless but believing. All right, sir. You doubted, put your finger in the prints of the nails. Thrust your finger into my side. If you don't believe, here are the wounds that I suffered when I died for all mankind. Put your finger in them. doesn't say that he did. All it says is when Thomas saw that 
those wounds were there and was challenged to put his finger into the wounds, Jesus added something else to it. He said, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. When Thomas saw those wounds, he said, my Lord and my God. And when he said it, it just absolutely was a fantastic, spectacular feeling to the man. But Jesus left us with a great, great uh, statement. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet they believe. I believe. I believe he's alive. I believe Jesus lives. One of the reasons why it was difficult for them to believe that he lived is they never did understand when he talked to them about the resurrection that it, he was going to live. They never did pick that up. In fact, one time when he drove the changers out of the temple, uh, the changers of money, uh, they asked him the reason why. why. Why did you do that? All we've seen out of you is compassion and love and tenderness and uh, we've never seen you act like this. That's what the uh, person that wrote that gospel said about it. They had not seen the Lord do anything like that. And when he answered them, he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up again. He wasn't talking about Solomon's temple. He was talking about the temple of his body. When he made that statement, he was telling them, he was telling them, I am God. They never picked that up. They thought he was talking about Solomon's temple. He was talking about the fact that though they would put him in the tomb, he would raise that body up. That's what he was saying. Destroy this temple. Three days, I'll raise it up. I like it. He didn't say he will raise it up. He said, I will raise it up. Because within him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. All principality and power. That's all governments. Principalities are governments. He's the head of all governments. He's the head of all power. Hell is a defeated foe. The devil's a defeated foe. He has no power over you if you don't let him. He ha does not have the ability to stop the church of the living God because the church belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. He brought it into existence. He filled it with his presence. He gave miracles and signs and wonders to the church. He gave them the power to remit and retain sins. And when he put his blessing on the church, there is no way the devil's going to whip the church. There's no way the devil can defeat the church. The church is in undefeated, indefatigable. It will never go down. It will last until Jesus comes. Because he said, I'm going to present unto me a church without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish, without any such thing. He was letting the whole world know, I've got something I bought and I'm not giving it to nobody. It belongs to me. The church belongs to the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, you ought to shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. The church belongs to God. It's a miracle. On the day of Pentecost, with one accord, in one place. I've seen them in one place. I've never seen them with one accord. But they're usually in one place. All with one accord, a sound as of a rushing mighty wind hit that room. And when it did, they left the room out under the porch of Solomon, praising God, speaking with other tongues. It brought questions, what meaneth this? These men are drunk on wine. 
Peter answered it. He said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Everybody say all flesh. All flesh. He could have used uh, Isaiah 28, 11, and 12. He could have said to them, uh, Isaiah said, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak unto this people. This is the rest wherewith ye shall cause the weary to rest. He didn't use it. He didn't use Jeremiah 31, 33. I'm going to do a new thing in Israel. I'm going to put my spirit on the fleshly tables of their heart. I'm going to write my law in their heart. It's not going to be an outward law. It's going to be an inward motivation that breathes from the inside out. And man will no more be subject to his sins or the power of Satan. I'm going to do a new thing in Israel. Why didn't Apostle Peter use Isaiah 28, 11 and 12 and Jeremiah 31, 33? It was to the Jew. And he didn't use them. I'm going to uh, uh, make you a little surprised when I tell you this. When the apostle Peter used the prophecy of Joel, when he said it, he didn't believe it. Hold on to that. It will come to pass in the last days, I'll pour up my spirit upon all flesh, not to an exclusive few. Not to just a singular group, but to all flesh. And then Peter said when they asked him after they were convicted, when he preached that marvelous message on the day of Pentecost about Jesus, the miracle worker, they were so disturbed. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And when he said that, or when they said that, I want you to notice uh, that they also, uh, that uh, Peter also said, he hath made this same Jesus both Lord and Christ, both Jehovah and Messiah. Both Jehovah and Messiah. He said something, I don't think you've heard too much about it. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This next verse is what astounds me. The promise is unto you and to all your children, and to all that are far off. That's the Gentiles. Peter didn't believe that. Peter didn't believe that. Why did he say it? God stuck it in his mouth and not in his brain. The Lord God never did use mental, earthly ability to get his word to mankind. Read what the Apostle Peter said. He said, holy men of God were moved on and they spake by the Holy Ghost. They, they did not write these books. Isaiah didn't write his book. Who wrote it? I don't know their names, but I'll tell you who wrote it. God sent the word, and great was the multitude that, what? What did they do? They published it. He sent the word. Read your Old Testament. Read it very carefully. His word was on my lips. His word was in my tongue. His word was on my mouth. Every one of the prophets said that. Every one, read it. His word was in my mouth. God don't trust the brain. He doesn't trust the mental mentality of man. Man is too warped in his thinking. He's too overcome by what he sees. That's why the apostle wrote and said, we walk not by sight, but by faith. We hold on to the treasures of God because we believe by faith. Three times he has to come. 
to the disciples. Maybe I can help you a little bit because I, through the years I always wondered about some things. Let me help you a little bit from the book of Isaiah. And it might help you to understand why the uh, disciples didn't know him on the road to Emmaus. Uh, in the, uh, I believe it's the 55th chapter of the book of Isaiah. Uh, let me confirm that for you while I get there. And just stay with me till I get there, will you please? Thank you. I want you to notice how Isaiah put it. And he put it in the most telling way. Here we go. As many were astonished at thee, astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men, so marred that they possibly couldn't believe. There are two things they were fighting. They were fighting their doubts, and they're trusting their eyesight. And they could not comprehend all the things that Jesus told them about his resurrection. They couldn't fully understand what he's trying to tell them. He told them, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the uh, great fish, I shall be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That passed them by completely. They never did pick that up. So here he comes, and apparently marred, apparently uh, so, uh, so broken in body that they couldn't understand all the fullness of what was standing before them. But here was the one that had the wounds. That's no doubt why he said to Thomas, look at my, the print of my nails. Look at my ribbon side. Look at it. Put your finger there. He was telling him, you can feel the evidence of my resurrection. I'm that one that died. I'm that one that overcame death. Uh, we preach about the keys to the kingdom. There are three keys. Repent, be baptized, every one of you, and your sins will be remitted. And then God does the other part. He fills you with the Holy Ghost. And uh, there are three keys, but there are two keys we never really put together with the New Testament church. Jesus has them, the keys of hell and death. I have the keys of hell and death. And he was letting the whole world know, I've conquered the strongest enemy of the human race. I've overcome the powers of death. I stand before you. Oh, check my prince. Check my side. I'm standing before you, whole man. Do you know what the apostles preached in the day they preached in the Acts of the Apostles? You know why many churches don't pick up the Acts of the Apostles? They say they believe in the resurrection, but the disciples preach the resurrection. That's the basic foundation of Acts of the Apostles. That tells us this is a book of miracles. How many believe you're going to raise from the dead if you die in Christ? Oh, if you don't believe that, you don't have any faith at all. You believe till you got the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the down payment of a purchased possession. It's the earnest of your inheritance. One day you're going to get the full, full will of God when he raises us from the dead. And let me tell you what's going to happen when he raises us from the dead. He's going to take them from the earth. He's going to take them from the sea. And there's going to be a great conclave of hallelujahs unto the Lord God in a future day when the Bible says that everyone that came out of the heavens, everyone out of the earth, everyone out from under the earth, everyone from out of the sea is going to cry out, hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. They're going to say it. And you may not say it tonight, but every creature, it says, every creature is going to call out, the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And the Bible says, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess 
all in the heaven, all in the earth, all in the sea, all that are under the earth, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I believe in this one God, Holy Ghost, tongue-talking way. I believe it's the greatest thing that was ever sent down from God out of heaven onto this earth. I'm glad that we're part of that company that has received the miracle of God's great Holy Spirit. And he's infused us with his divine nature. Man, I want to shout hallelujah. Everybody's going to do it, saved or unsaved. They're going to acknowledge him. That won't save them. But one of these days, the, the revelator, the, the one that received the revelation, John, said this, the sound of many waters. It was sound of many thunders. It was a sound that filled the whole universe. What sound? That he reigns. That he's on the throne. That he lives. He's living tonight. I stand on a boat in Jamaica one day, Pastor. And while I was on that boat, there was a Rastafarian standing next to me. A Rastafarian is a Jamaican who... Uh, eats ganja. That's the weed they grow, and it's a dope. And they get a little wild at times. People in Jamaica are a little afraid of them. And uh, I was standing next to this big uh, Rastafarian, and the boat that was coming in the harbor had Haley Selassie on it. And he looked at me very proudly and said, My God is on that boat. Haley Selassie was his God. I knew that Haley Selassie was coming because they announced it in the newspapers. I wanted to go see Haley, too. And so while I was standing next to him, uh, he was just, he said, I cannot wait to see my God. And I said, your God is Haley Selassie? Oh, yes, yes. And so in comes the sleek little white boat. It anchors at the harbor there. Here comes Haley Selassie, dressed in the regal garments of a king. Gold braid, white hat, white suit. Walked out, and the rest of the parents said, Oh, oh, my God, is so little. <laughs> Five feet, four inches tall. Oh, my God, is so little. He said, is your God big? I said, man, I got a big God. I got a great, big, tall God. How tall is your God? Heaven is his throne. Earth is his footstool. He fills the atmosphere. He is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He can say, I go away, and he's still here. He can say, I'll come again, and he's still here. The whole universe is filled with the glory of God. The whole universe is filled with the touch of God. It's a mighty God in Christ. He didn't come to find out about you. He came to let us know about him. He owned all the gold on a, uh, all the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns all the silver and gold. He didn't come for the silver and gold. He didn't come for the cows. He came for you and I. And he wanted you and I to know how much he loved us. You're not in just another gathering. You're in a foundational, powerful, Holy Ghost church. You're in something that's called by his name. You're in something that he loves with all his heart. The church will never go down. When principalities and powers are gone, the church will still be. Oh, thank God. Oh, God in heaven. 
I want everybody to know about this church. I want everybody to know about this Lord. It's hard for us to get up and not talk about it. My Lord, if, if we don't talk about it, we'll burst. Got to talk about it. My wife's mother was such a wonderful woman, and uh, she came from a society family. She got the Holy Ghost, got in the church. She would testify to her sisters and her brothers. They'd get together, and the first thing she'd do, oh, let me tell you about Jesus. Well, they got upset at her. We're having a, a reunion in a month. Don't start that Jesus stuff. Well, she said, I'll try hard. I'll try hard not to say anything about it. And then they get there, and she starts right out. One of her sisters said, you're going to go to the insane asylum with that Pentecostal stuff. That sister ended up in the insane asylum. That lady ended up in the insane asylum. And when she ended up in the insane asylum, I want you to know that uh, she didn't get well till she called for us to come and pray for her. And when several of us went up to pray for her, she got well. Since that time, numbers of their family have come into the church. The lady has gone buried and gone to her future reward, whatever that may be, but the rest of the family that lives is now receiving this truth. <laughs> Mrs. Hobby could not hold back her testimony. She testified to everybody. And in connection with that, this church has been left in this world, and Paul said we sit in heavenly places. Heavenly places is not the gathering of the church. We might call it heavenly to be here, and certainly it is. But I want you to know something about that, those high places. The Bible says that the devil is the prince and the power of the air. So God put the church in high places. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Spiritual wickedness and powers in where? High places. That's not the president's house, the White House. That's where the devil is. He stuck the church there and said, devil, you can't have this one. I've got this one here as a definite opposition against your works. And that's why Paul said to the Ephesian church that the church may know the wisdom of God who has set it in high places. So that you and I should know and understand that the church is God's bulwark against Satan. And, you know, we, we get to a point where we think Satan's got a lot of power. No, he does not. He's a defeated foe. That's why he said, anything you ask in my name, I will give it unto you. Anything you ask. Many, many times he said that very thing. If you ask it in my name, if you will do it in my name, if you'll go forth in my name, if you'll speak in my name, I will do certain miracles for you. How many were at the Milwaukee conference? Anybody here? You remember the night that great praise went across that audience? You remember that night? It went for an hour. Just praise. Pure, undefiled praise. Nobody hyped it up. It broke up. Just praise. Uh, I was to introduce the preacher. I was standing there ready to introduce Brother Mooney, and uh, I couldn't. The praise was going. It would die down, then swell again like a river. Just kept going back and forth over that. An hour. I turned to Brother Mooney. I said, what will I do with it? He said, let it go. I said, that's what I was intending to do, but I didn't want to cause you any apprehensions about it. There's nothing we can do with this meeting but just let the people praise God. While they're praising God, a young man came up, grabbed hold of my coattail, and said, my grandmother's walking. And I didn't know what he was talking about. 
I wanted to say, my grandmother walks too. But I, I didn't know what he was talking about. And he said, my grandmother's right down there, brother. I shouldn't look at her. And so I looked, and there was a woman, hands raised, just praising God. I said, well, she's praising God. said, she got out of a wheelchair. She'd been 15 years paralyzed. My grandmother's walking down there. He's a miracle worker. Jesus of Nazareth going about doing miracles. The church today has to pick up that, that great faith in the person of Jesus. We've got to get to the point where we believe there's nothing impossible with him. Say, has it worked every time? I can't tell you that, but I know he can. I can't tell you every time I pray, everything's happened. I can't tell you that, but I can tell you I know he can at any time when he wants to. The Bible tells us he gives gifts unto men. And he does. See, it's a gifted thing we have here tonight. Someone said, what is the noise of this tabernacle? Oh, friend, don't knock it till you taste it. Don't knock it till you taste it. Get a taste of it and you'll do just like the rest of the folks. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! You know, you, you get to doing that and you just, hey, man, what do we got here? Ah, what do we got here? We got victory here. We got glory here. We've got Jesus here. We got his name here. It's a strong tower. The righteous runneth in and is safe. We've got a marvelous name. Hallelujah. Oh, give him praise. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your name. Glory to God. Jesus comes walking on the water. And John said, it is the Lord. It's the Lord, Simon Peter. He got that great coat around him. At the great coat, took it off, plunged into the sea to go to Jesus. Somewhere back in his memory, there was a time when Jesus came by and said to Simon Peter and those fishing with him, James and John, said, leave your nets and follow me. But before he said that, he said to them, cast your net out into the deep. We've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word. Nevertheless, because you said it. He threw the net out. Couldn't bring in the net because of so many fish. What you can do in his name is beyond your imagination. What you can do through him is mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. What you can do through him causes devils to tremble. Here is the third time he, they had to see a miracle before they could really believe. They had seen the miracle of his resurrection by the print of the nails by the ribbon side. I want you to know this is a miracle church. Whenever you walk in that door, come in believing for a miracle. Don't walk through these doors with your, uh, with your criticism and with your uh, gossip. Don't, don't come through these doors with that. Walk in this place with a hallelujah on your lips and a faith in your heart that God's going to do something miraculous. And he'll do it. He's exceeding abundantly able to do it. Many of you are not acquainted with our pioneers. I had the privilege as a boy 
growing up in a home where many of the original pioneers of the 20th century would come and visit. And I remember this, and Grace will remember it too. Whenever the preachers came, we had an all-day prayer meeting. And we see them come and say, uh-uh, another all-day prayer meeting. And they'd have it, man, they'd have it. And, and my dad had the ability of holding his head, his hand on my head and keeping my squirming body down because an eight-year-old boy didn't have the knees for prayer. He'd hold my head and pray and talk in tongues and never miss a lick. I had to go through that time. I look back at that now and saw what the Lord did for me, and I didn't even know what he's doing for me. I didn't recognize what God was putting in my life, that power of prayer. The men I talk about tonight were all men of prayer. All of them. During that day. But he said to my dad, he said, the Lord has given me a song. This was in 1928. The Lord's given me a song. I can faintly remember, but since that, my memory has been strengthened by what I've heard. When gloom and sadness whispers, he was singing, you sinned, no use to pray. I look away to Jesus, and he tells me to say, I see a crimson stream of blood that flows. I heard him sing it. Didn't know what it meant. I sing it tonight, and please, my eyes fill with tears when I think of the God-given gift he gave to G.T. Haywood and that song. The first time he sang it in his church on a Sunday morning, uh, Bishop uh, Golder told me this. He said the first time he sang it, 50 people got the Holy Ghost after he finished singing that song. Today no condemnation abides to turn away. My soul from its salvation, it's here ever to stay. I see a crimson stream of blood. It flows from Calvary. Its waves which reach the throne of God are sweeping over me. Oh, leadership, you talk about leadership. The man was before his times in his thinking. He was deeply involved in the scriptures. He could pour it out on an audience. Folks that sat under him would tell me that every time they went to the house of God, they were fed with the finest of the wheat. That was one of the papers he printed, the finest of the wheat. They were fed from the life of a man who was in tune with the law. Ruth Cliburn was one of our great champions in that day. Some years ago, we were in Italy and we were in uh, Catania, Sicily. We preached for our b pastor brother, uh, Salvatore Archidiacono. That means Salvation Archdeacon. I told him one day, you don't need the Holy Ghost with a name like that. <laughs> You've been wonderfully endowed already. And that day we'd spent the whole day in church on Sunday and nothing but a very light breakfast. All day we were in church, morning, afternoon, night. At about 11.30 he said, you know, we're not going to be able to make it to the restaurant. But he said, there's one nightclub that's open. And he said, that's the only thing that's open, Brother Hershon. Uh, and uh, there's no place to go but to go there. So we went there with trepidation and... <laughs> When we got there, we said, isn't the restaurant open? said, no, the restaurant's closed. It's the only thing that's open. Well, would you put us in a corner far away from what's happening? They put us in the corner. While we're in the corner, 
When we walked in, my wife saw the beautiful white piano they had, and she was awed by the piano. She said, what a beautiful piano. We looked at it a little bit, went and sat down. I don't know how the proprietor found out that she sang, but he came to the table in a little bit. He had an entertainer there, and he said, ma'am, would you go to the piano and sing? She looked at me and said, you know, they don't even understand English here tonight. What am I going to sing? I said, well, sing. She went, the first song she sang was, There is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he can do for you. When she sang it, though they didn't understand, they felt the spirit in the lady that went out to the people. I saw people weeping. Clapped her back a second time. Clapped her back a third time. A fourth time. A fifth time, a sixth time. Finally, she turned to me, what else should I sing? I said, sing Down From His Glory. That's to the turn of, tune of O Solo Mio. When she started Down From His Glory, they all got up and started singing, O Solo Mio. And the whole place was singing, O Solo Mio. Man came up and said, he could talk English, he said, Lady, you don't know what you did to me. I don't know who you are, but whatever you are reached down into my heart. I said, I need God. The, the proprietor come over to us and said, Champagne for this table. I said, no, 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 Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola for this table. Really something. Come back the next night, they came down after her, said, Come on up, they're calling for you up there. Two of the people that served us that night were filled with the Holy Ghost. They were baptized in the name of the Lord. You never know. But it's amazing to know that through the ministry of these men, Oh, Brother Howard Goss used to come. Uh, did you know him, Brother Walls? Oh, uh, he was a delight to be around. But you know what he'd do with young preachers? He'd suggest a topic in the Bible and take the opposite side to what you were just to get you in a contentious argument. Then he'd sit back and listen to what you knew about the Bible. He would do that. He, he, one day he'd come in and said, I understand that you don't serve wine for communion. I said, that's right. You serve grape juice? Yeah. It's got no life in it. And there I am arguing for grape juice. I can't say. He'd go across the country, do that with the young preachers. He came back several years after that. He sat down and said, you know, I'm for grape juice and you're for wine. He forgot. He forgot. And I said, I'm for grape juice. Oh, oh, I forgot. I forgot. He would do that to us just to see what we knew about the Bible. And he'd come to your home. And if you tell him something, he had that bald head. He was a big man. Whenever he got astounded by something, he rubbed both those hands over the bald head and said, my Lord, have mercy. He started every Pentecostal organization almost that exists. Started the Assemblies of God. When he got the truth, he started the PAW, Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. He started uh, the United Pentecostal Church. He was the one that brought the PAJC. He was one of them, brought the PAJC and the PCI together. Uh, other brethren were there, but he started the old PCI. He started the Assemblies of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brother Goss was an organizer of religious people. And he had a great ability at doing it, getting people to get together and work together. The United Pentecostal Church, as an organization, we don't glory in the organization of it. We glory in the Jesus that fills it with an understanding of a vision for a needy world. And we work together for that purpose to reach everybody we can in these last days. That's why the United Pentecostal Church exists. It doesn't exist to put titles on men. Titles are not anything great. 
three ways. It's in you, the hope of glory, the blessing of God that's in your life. That means everything. Titles are man-made. God is the author of blessing. These men had leadership. Let me tell you uh, something about uh, some of them. My dad was a, uh, well, a pioneer of this one. This boldest thing you ever saw in your life. He would praise God anywhere. Anytime, any place. And if you said something about it, said, I have a right. He'd tell you that. I've got a right to praise his name. If you went to a restaurant with him, he'd sing a song. Every time you went. This was his favorite little song. Thank you, Lord, for being so sweet. Thank you, Lord, for the good things to eat. Thank you, Lord, for your children that sing. Thank you, Lord, for everything. Oh, Amen. And he'd fill the restaurant with his song. And everybody would look at us. Twice we had our bill paid. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Try it. Try it sometime. You might get your lunch free. <laughs> Tell you what. One day he invited my sister-in-law. She was a little on the, uh, the so-called society side, you know, a little bit on the uh, dignified side. Your precious dad invited me to go to dinner with you today. Oh, she said he was so kind. He said, I know it's going to be a great experience. I said, you will never forget it. <laughs> we got in that restaurant, and there he goes. Thank you, Lord. He said, we are now going to sing. Emma said, sing? In a restaurant, she started to sit down. I said, stand up, lady. We all have to face it. Thank you, Lord, for being so sweet. When he get to that oh, man, man, he wanted to be an opera singer. He go, oh man, fill the whole place with his um. Everybody knew we were there. Nobody doubted it. He made sure that they knew we were there. He went to a, an Episcopalian uh, a bishops' conference one day. At the invitation of his attorney, who was an Episcopalian, he said, I want you to come and listen to the bishops discuss their matters for the Episcopalian church. Went to St. John the Divine Church, got in the church. He couldn't hear what was being said from the uh, uh, table of the bishops because St. John the Divine Church is a huge church in New York. It's probably one of the biggest auditoriums in the world. He couldn't hear well, so he told the attorney, take me down in front where I can hear better. Well, there was this crowd there. He took him down and squeezed him in, and he was a little uncomfortable. He saw an empty place at the table with the bishops and walked up and took the place with the bishops. And when he got up, they stood up and bowed to him. He bowed to them and sat down. He was born with three gallbladders. I want you to know he wasn't afraid of anything or anybody. And he loved this message. Man, he loved it. Make us say in Jesus' name before we walked in the house. Make us say in Jesus' name when we walked out of the house. When we got in the car, he said in Jesus' name. If a woman was driving, he'd say it twice. <laughs> Always, he'd say, all that you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus. He practiced it. He practiced it. He had some fake $20 bills made. They looked like $20 bills on the backside with Acts 238 and 39. He'd throw that down in the subway and folks crack heads trying to get that $20 bill. He'd stand on the outside before it would leave and watch them squirming for that $20 bill. The police department called him up and said, you cannot be throwing those $20 bills on the floor like that. Somebody's going to get injured. And said, it isn't a $20 bill. It's a tract. He said, yes, that's a tract. He said, why don't you tell them it's a tract? He said, that's the beauty of it. 
I know that people want money, and when they get this, they get the wealth of heaven. Policeman said, all right, sir, go on home. <laughs> Had that kind of feel. Oh, can I say a few more things? Let me say this. Thank you for the opportunity. There was a man by the name of Ben Pemberton in St. Louis. He was one of the most outstanding men. You talk about colorful. He was another one. Not afraid of anything, anybody. He was a circus acrobat that got saved. While he'd preach, he'd do a flip. <laughs> While he'd be preaching, he'd just stop and flip. And, of course, people came to see him flip. <laughs> and he'd preach to them. He was something else. A, 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 a man used to come and preach for him by the name of Guy Bohannon. He was 6 feet 11, weighed 300 pounds, a former wrestler. I, I heard Guy Bohannon tell me he, he would growl when he preached. Praise God! Glory to God! One night he said, I'm preaching tonight on Samson and the lion. He said, I'll be Samson and Ben will be the lion. Ben said, no, I won't. <laughs> Chased him all over the church to try to get him to be the lion. Through chairs, up on the pulpit, around chairs, holding on to the piano. I couldn't believe it. I'm sitting there. But Ben had a church of 1,700 back in 1,935 and 40. You talk about winning people to God. He prophesied the death of Kennedy in Dallas. He died on the same day that the president died. The FBI came to St. Louis. They had heard that uh, Reverend Ben Pemberton had said Kennedy was going to die in Dallas. I had preached his funeral. It was the next day after the funeral. I was standing there when the FBI came in. Said, we'd like to see Ben Pemberton. Where is he? And I pointed like that. He said, up in his room? I said, no. He said, where are you pointing? I said, toward heaven. The FBI said, he's in heaven? Yeah. I said, yesterday was his funeral. He's going to be with the Lord. Where did he get his information from us? <laughs> In heaven again? I said, yeah, got it from heaven. He got up and told us all about it. People thought he was crazy. Thought he was zany. But he got it from the Lord and told us. He'd do many things that we would think. He's just beside himself. He got, he got in a situation one day. Uh, he must have cut in front of a car. He said, Brother Urshan, he told me the story, but he said, Brother Urshan, this man got out of the car. He was at least six feet four. He had the biggest hands. They looked like bananas hanging out of his sleeve. He got out. And this man said, roll your window down. I'm going to train you a little bit about driving. And Ben said, I knew he was going to hit me. And he's right up against my door. I said, well, if you back up from the door, I can get out. And he got out a little, it looked like a little senator. He said, now wait, wait just a minute before you strike me. Let me pray. <laughs> so he gets down on his knees and said, Lord, I'm a coming home. <laughs> and, you know, he said, don't make it too painful when I get there. And he said, this man's going to strike me. And he said, don't let me feel it. And the man's watching him. Then he gets up and goes, What are you doing? I'm blowing up my hands as big as yours. He says, Oh, get away. You're crazy. Got back in his, got back in his car and took off. <laughs> Praise God. Several ways to skin cats. <coughs> this is your heritage. You can't believe how these people stirred others. Ruth Cliburn, the beautiful song, Down from His Glory, Ever a Living Story. 
my God and Savior came. Jesus was his name. Born in a manger to his own a stranger, a man of sorrow, grief, and agony. Oh, how I love him. How I adore him. My breath, my sunshine. My all in all. The great creator became my Savior. And in him dwelleth all the fullness of God. What condescension bringing us redemption when in the dead of night, not one faint hope in sight, God, gracious, tender, laid aside his splendor, stooping to woo, to win, to save my soul. Without reluctance, flesh and blood his substance took the form of man, revealed a hidden plan. Oh, glorious mystery, sacrifice of Calvary. And now I know thou art the great I am. We sing it till this day. They asked, recently someone said, why do you take all those oneness songs and sing them? They don't believe what we believe, but they sing our song. It's interesting, isn't it? We had a debate with this doctor, uh, oh, what was his last name, Martin. And he followed us uh, to the plane. We were taking the same plane he was out of uh, uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. He followed us to the plane. He was singing... He was singing uh, a song that was uh, actually composed by Bishop R.C. Lawson in New York City, who headed the uh, uh, Refuge Churches of Christ on the East Coast, a oneness group. He was singing, His name shall be praised. His name shall be praised. The name of the Lord is a mighty strong tower. His name shall be praised. I turned him and said, You're singing. A oneness song. He said, I am? I said, yeah, that's a oneness song. Put together by a oneness preacher. God gave it to him. Oh, let me sing another. I see a crimson stream of blood. I said, that's a oneness song. I said, man, you can't get away from us. We'll follow you all over this earth. We'll follow you all over this earth. Because this is a never dying truth. It's a never dying truth. If you don't handle it and love it, God will give it to somebody else. Take your place and put somebody else in your place if you won't love it and hold on to it. Oh, man. Oh, I could tell you some more about this. Let me tell you one more. L.R. Uten, who's one of the founders of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, very fine-looking man, great singer. His wife died. After she died, he married a second time. His choice wasn't as good the second time. He married a genuine feminine spitfire. And she would contest him while he was preaching. Oh, yeah. He asked her one night to dismiss in the service she was from New England. She said, I shan't. I shan't. That means she would not, shall not. And his second marriage wasn't the fine one his first marriage was. But you know what's wonderful? He composed a song in that second marriage that we sing today. To be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. On earth I long to be like him. All through life's journey from earth to glory, I always ask to be like him. Something good came out of that marriage. She tarnished his wonderful ministry by her attitude. It was a sad thing. Where he preached to throngs, he ended up in a little small church because he married somebody that did not understand her great calling. A woman can help you or hurt you. Depends on how she reacts. I'm so glad my dad told me to marry Sister Jean. Yeah, he did. I said, don't pick out my wife for me. I'll pick out my wife. He said, you don't have enough sense. I'm trying to help you. I'm so glad what he did. I'm so glad. 
that I listened to my dad. Hallelujah. Well, I, I don't know what to do here. You're such a wonderful audience. How many, how many need the Holy Ghost here tonight? How many really want the Holy Ghost? You, you don't have it and you want it. Just put up your hand. There's a little girl. Thank God for children. They're so willing. Anybody that doesn't have the Holy Ghost, raise your hand. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to come down after you. Son, that's fine. He that hungers and thirsts after righteousness, same shall be filled. Your pastor said it tonight. You can get the Holy Ghost here tonight. Someone else over here will raise their hand? Hold it up. So that, thank you. I appreciate that, man. And another young lady there. God bless you, precious people. It's for you. It's a gift. Doesn't want you to beg for it. He wants you to praise him for it. He just wants you to get up and look from the depths of your heart, praise him. If you'd come down this aisle praising God, there's no telling but that he'd fill you with the Holy Ghost as you praise him. But you've got to be willing to do it. Oh, let's all stand and praise the Lord here tonight. Let's all stand and give him praise. This is a miracle church. The God that gave it to us gave us a miracle. He brought the power of his spirit down upon that original group on the day of Pentecost. It has never died since. It still lives. He wouldn't give the first church something he wouldn't give the last day church. If he gave it to the first church, he would give it to you. The book of Acts never ends. It just says in the last few verses, because they would not hear. And because they had eyes to see and ears to hear. And yet they would not believe. I'm going to go and preach to the Gentiles. That's how the book of Acts ends. The book of Acts has never ended, really. It's still an open book. People are scared to death of it. Walk into the deep rivers of truth. Walk through the walls of tradition. Jump over the top of doubters. Reach into the heart of God. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Let's praise him again. Oh, wonderful, Elder. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's praise him. Hallelujah. 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 Listen to me. Listen to me. After preaching like this tonight, there's got to be some sincere people in this room that says, I want what that man preached about. Amen. Amen. You're in the church where, where it's real. I mean, we're talking about something that we've got. How many of you received the Holy Ghost? You, you, you've received it. Spoken in other tongues, just like they did in the Bible. You know it's real. Listen, the Lord wants you to have that. And you that raised your hands and you that didn't raise your hands, we're going to sing a chorus. And somebody next to you hopefully is going to invite you to come to this altar. And if you've repented, come and stand here and begin to worship the Lord all the way down the aisle with your hands upraised. And God's going to fill you with the Holy Ghost. Amen. If you're here and you need it, while we're singing, come it's on. It's for me. It's for you. Amen. Come it's on. For your children. This Holy Ghost is for and you. Their children too. It's Amen. something. Everybody singing. Nothing else can do. Would you like to have the Holy Ghost tonight? It's here. That's right. That's Come on, the brother. Second chapter you can read for yourself. Hey, man. You don't have to ask. There's others here. Come on. Else about the Holy Ghost. You're doing the right thing. Jesus God bless you, sir. That's right. You're doing the right thing. It's for me. 
and it's for you. God bless you. Come on. For your children. Come on, sir. And their children. God's talking to your heart. Something That's right. That Come on, sir. Else do. God bless you. Some of you that know how to pray, help us. Oh, Some of you that know how to pray. Don't have to ask Come on. Come on. Come on. The Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Jesus, Jesus is given away. Is given away. Oh, 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 it's for me. Come on. And it's for you. It's for you. It's for your children. That's right, brother. Come on. And their children, too. Come on. Yeah, that nothing it's real. Else can do. God bless you, brother. Come on. That's right. Come on. You don't, don't have, have to ask. ask. There's others here. Come on. Holy Ghost is here. Jesus I feel the Holy Ghost tonight. Come on, let's sing it again. Let's let the Holy Ghost do its work here tonight. Some of you that know how to pray, come and help me. Everybody, minister to these people. Come on. Others that need the Holy Ghost, it's here. Come on. The second chapter, you can read it for yourself. You don't have, don't have to ask, ask anybody, anybody else. else about the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. The, the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. They're still coming. Come on. Oh, it's for me. Amen. It's here. It's for you. Amen. Holy Ghost is already here. Hey man, they're, they're still coming. Come on. It's for you. Come on. The second chapter, you can read it for yourself. You don't have to ask anybody else about the Holy Ghost that my Jesus is giving away. Oh, it's for me and it's for you. There's others, there's others, there's others. And their children too. Holy Ghost is here tonight. Oh, 